You know, when I bought this hoodie, I accidentally ordered a large instead of a medium, and uh, now I look like I'm taking fashion advice from Ariana Grande. No hate, obviously, but, you know, I just, someone's gonna bring it up. Yes, I am aware. This thing is too big for me. So, a lot of people are gonna be mad about this video. <laughs> I just know right ahead of time. So, before we really get started, I just wanna say that to be a good creative in any field, really, you have to be a good critic in that field first. Like, whatever it is you're discussing, whether it's film, painting, books, music, YouTube videos, you have to be able to dissect it and know what does and doesn't work. Now, that said, being a good critic does not automatically make you a good creator, but it's a necessary first step in the process. If you don't understand what works and what doesn't, then you can't understand how to make something good. Which brings me to Will Jordan, aka The Critical Drinker. He is best known for being a movie critic, please note the quotes around that, here on YouTube, and he's not very good at it. So when I heard that he has a whole series of published spy thrillers, I figured I should check it out one of these days because it's by a guy who doesn't really understand how a story works, so it probably has some good fodder for mockery, and spoiler alert, I was correct. It does have some good fodder for mockery. Now, Redemption is the first book in the Ryan Drake series. It's about a man named Ryan Drake, who used to be a soldier in the British Special, Special Air Service, the, the SAS, so British Special Forces, and now he works for the CIA here in America. That's weird. The reasons why he works for the CIA are never made super clear. Like, it's hinted that the sequels are going to explain it in more detail, but it... It's not explained here, and maybe the explanation does make sense, maybe it doesn't. It is kind of weird, though, because, like, the CIA is probably a little hesitant about directly having foreigners work for them, but sure, whatever. Now, Ryan Drake is tasked with breaking a CIA asset out of prison, and then things spiral out of control from there, which forces him to go on the run. There are a lot of problems with Redemption, as you can tell by the many, many tabs I have there. Uh, the villains are idiots. The plot meanders for long stretches of time with very little happening. Multiple chapters in here just repeat what we learned in the last chapter. I'm not making that up. There are multiple chapters that do that. There's a bunch of stupid nonsense in here. Like, that, that's the best way I can think to describe it. Just like people getting shot and there's no effect on them or there's an explosion right nearby and people are okay, you know, things like that where it's, it's not just unrealistic, it's just kind of stupid. And the action scenes are described with all the intensity and passion of Uncle Colum from Dairy Girls. But then I heard tell of a fella from Ballin' a Hinch. What was it his name was now? I had it there a minute ago. Ah, it'll come to me. Anyway. Not to mention it's ungodly stretched out. You can see here, this is a pretty thick book. It's pretty chunky. It's about 550 pages, at least this copy is. There's maybe 300 pages worth of story here. And for a thriller, which is a genre that's like fast-paced and exciting by its very nature, that's an even bigger sin than it would be for something else like, say, a romance or science fiction. And all of those things are bad. Those are all problems with this book. But you know the biggest problem? It's boring! Oh my god, it's boring. This is a book about spies, and terrorists, and gunfights, and explosions, and prison breaks, and international conspiracies, and I could not stay awake while reading. Literally. I literally fell asleep twice while reading this thing. And here's the thing, it's not the worst book ever. It does have a few things in here that kind of work, which we'll get into. The setup is cool, and there are one or two moments that got me invested, but it never goes beyond the level of just being kind of cool. You know, it, it never goes beyond that. Like, this is a bloated mess that I couldn't bring myself to care about in the slightest. It's not the worst YouTuber book I've ever read, by any means at all, but it's probably the most boring. You know, there's stuff in here like plot holes and flat characters and things like that, and those are all bad and annoying, sure, but mostly I just didn't care. The book didn't even try to make me care. That's the thing. It, it barely tried to do anything at all. And spoilers ahead, but, you know, trust me, there's nothing worth reading this book for. But if you do want to read it, I don't recommend it, and spoilers are following from here. 
Oh, perfect. It's in Japanese. Jing Chao Nong Ning Dao. Wait, that's Chinese. Luckily, I can read Barricade. So, as many of you probably know, Onision, the famous YouTuber, infamous is probably a better word, YouTuber, has a trilogy of books, and those have been endlessly mocked here on YouTube and elsewhere across the internet. And back when that was really big and going on a lot, like in 2019, I guess, I saw a few people cry about how people only mocked his books because they didn't like him. And those people were mostly laughed at, as they deserve to be laughed at. Because those books are terrible no matter who wrote them. The fact that the guy who wrote them is a crazy asshole doesn't make much difference. Those aren't mutually exclusive. The books are awful, and Onision's awful. So keep that in mind as we go forward, because ever since I announced I was covering this book, I've gotten people crying about how I'm just dis projecting my dislike of this guy onto his work, which is obviously elite tier, and those people are really, really stupid. Like, they're incapable of hearing criticism of their favorite talking head on the internet, so if you see any of them in the comments or anywhere else crying about how I'm being mean and I just don't understand Critical Drinker's genius, pretend they're talking about Onision instead and you'll see exactly how ridiculous it sounds. I really need to point out that Will Jordan and his friends historically aren't great at handling criticism. <laughs> Like, there's going to be several podcasts, live streams, and or poorly thought out rant videos screeching about everything I say here, and a lot of them are either going to edit me to misrepresent what I say, or they're going to pause in mid-sentence to argue against individual words and completely miss the point of everything I'm saying, but their fans are going to treat it like some brilliant and objective takedown of anyone who dares think and speak differently than them. After that last line, EFAP probably paused and spent 10 minutes crying about it, so it's been a while since you've heard my voice. Hello again, everyone. I don't care that much what any of them think. Like, they're annoying, but the least they can do is leave mean comments on this video, which just boosts it in the algorithm, so I guess go ahead. Getting to the author of this book, Will Jordan slash The Critical Drinker is, in a word, annoying? Like, like he's... Some of you aren't going to believe me when I say this, but he's a movie critic who mostly just whines that Disney movies don't line up with his political beliefs. And if you don't believe me, he's said it before. <laughs> like, he tried really, really hard to push a movie called The Sound of Freedom, which is a movie made by sexual predators about the real-life adventures of a different sexual predator, and he tries to say it's a good movie just because he agrees with the message. I'm not even exaggerating come to the same conclusion that uh, children being sold into child sex trafficking is, is a terrible thing and should absolutely be stopped at any cost. And so uh, a movie about trying, you know, a main hero who's trying to prevent that is trying to rescue children from the most horrifying situations imaginable. Wow, that should be the sort of thing that you should really have no qualms about supporting. And You're saying that what a movie is about is something that you should have no qualms about supporting? That merely the subject matter is something that you should support? That's insane! That's insane! Oh, a movie's about child sex trafficking, therefore you should have no qualms about supporting it? Because what it's about? Not about the filmmaking? You person talking about films? By that logic, I could film myself taking a shit for two hours, and then at the very end of that two-hour film, just have a message on screen saying, child sex trafficking is bad, and it would be a good movie. Like, you agree with the message, therefore it's good. Like, <laughs> it's so stupid. And also leaving aside the fact that that movie is just grifting. Like, it has a QR code at the end, which, when you scan it, it doesn't take you to, like, a charity website to help with human trafficking or anything. It brings you to a spot where you can buy more tickets. We believe this movie has the power to be a huge step forward towards ending child ah, trafficking. Right. We believe this movie will be a huge step forward toward ending child trafficking, was the quote. You're gonna, you're gonna tell us how you're gonna spend the funds? We're gonna end child trafficking by just selling tickets to our movie. Very, 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 very not sus. Very, very not sus, Charlie Kirk and the Critical Drinker. Very not sus. Hello everyone, filmmakers here. Give us more money or you want kids to get trafficked. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And for what it's worth, that movie is not the worst thing ever, but it's just, it's not very well put together. It's not very well made. But the right-wing hive mind demands that Will Jordan say that it's perfect, so he says it. 
Hello again to all of the people who are watching this secondhand. Whoever is reacting to this probably just paused after that last line to claim that anyone who dares point out that a transparent money-making scheme is a transparent money-making scheme is clearly a pedophile. You haven't heard my voice for a while, but hello again. That Sound of Freedom thing doesn't even count all the apolitical movies that Will Jordan twists and trying to claim that they're pushing an agenda. And if he can't make it look like it's pushing an agenda, he will just lie about it. Like, in a video he made about Star Trek Picard, which I don't have strong feelings on that show, but he claims that the show is trying to emasculate Picard when Picard is literally meant to be a, the hero in the scene that he is showing. Once the epitome of the thinking man's hero, now reduced to a confused, frail old man who needs to be put firmly in his place by someone more diverse. The sheer f***ing hubris. Yeah, that'll teach you to get ideas above your station, John Luke. Here's a little more context. There was a choice between allowing the Federation to implode or letting the Romulans go. The Federation does not get to decide if a species lives or dies. Yes, we do. We absolutely do. In this scene in Picard, we see his plan being utterly rejected by the Admiral, but we're meant to sympathize with Picard. One of the themes of the first season of Picard is how Starfleet as an institution has abandoned its principles. Therefore, this reading of Picard is not really engaging with the series at all. It's just using it as a tool to reinforce a narrative that media is telling society that men should be subservient to women. In a video he made about the Barbie movie, he claims that the movie is trying to show that all men are evil, but that's not even in the same universe as what happened. The important jobs are done by the Barbies, and the Kens just kind of exist. They've got no inherent value, they contribute nothing, they have no power or say in how their society is run, and they're basically looked down on as a bit silly and irrelevant by the Barbies. Oh my goodness, what could the writers possibly be trying to tell us about their views on men? <laughs> Could it be a tongue-in-cheek inversion of our familiar gender politic? Could the point here be a sort of defamiliarization of the role women are often still forced into, flipping those traits, eye candy, peripheral, subordinate, back onto male characters in order to highlight how and why society's foisting of these upon anyone is a problem? Or could the fact that, regardless of context, men are on the bottom rung of the ladder, are subservient, simply mean film thinks men bad? The creators hate men, and that's that. Actually, he lies a couple of times about that movie. And I guess that's the thing that really struck me about this film. A lot of parents will have been duped into taking their daughters along to watch this movie, probably expecting the kind of breezy, colourful, family-friendly movie that was advertised, only to find- Because you know what kids love? You know what those little guys just go nuts for? You know what gets them hyped about going to the pictures? Stanley Kubrick references. <laughs> Barbie eventually finds the kid who plays with her, who turns out to be an asshole communist activist feminist that I think the movie wants us to empathise with, but Fuck me, for the life of me, I could not tell you why. Let me help you out. Surprisingly, no. We're not really supposed to empathize with the girl who calls Barbie a fascist and makes her cry. Or how when he released a video about the House of the Dragon trailer, he claimed no one cared about the show, and then when it came out and it was very popular and well-liked, he changed the video title and refused to acknowledge his orig original take. This guy will only ever tell his audience what they demand to hear. And as a critic myself, I find that remarkably sad. Like, you guys might disagree with what I say, but at least what I say matches what I think. You know, I got a lot of hate a couple months ago for disliking Baldur's Gate 3, but I wasn't paid to say I hate it. I didn't say it to get a lot of attention. That video didn't do super well. I just hated it. Will Jordan also works with The Daily Wire, the right-wing news organization that Ben Shapiro works at, and has given glowing reviews to several of their movies, like Lady Ballers and Terror on the Prairie. Movies that pretty much everyone across the political spectrum mocked for being boring and stupid. Drinker has reviewed several of the Daily Wire's movies, including Run, Hide, Fight, Terror on the Prairie, and Lady Ballers. He's okay. also far gentler on these movies than he is with mainstream titles. Here's how he described the Daily Wire's Lady Ballers. It's not on par with the mid-2000s classics like Dodgeball, Anchorman, or Tropic Thunder that it seems to want to emulate. This movie is very much a rough gem, the imperfect first attempt of a company that's still finding its feet as a movie studio. For anyone familiar with this movie, which yes, I have watched, the term rough gem is incredibly charitable. Don't worry though, I'm sure he's not being paid to push those movies or push any specific political viewpoints. Now, I, I could go on for a while because basically every Critical Drinker video is exactly like this. Like, the quality of films doesn't matter to him, 
and it never has. Like, all of his content is 100% there to try and feed into culture war nonsense. Like, he, he gets offended for a living. You know, he's like Anita Sarkeesian for neckbeards. There, granted, there's a lot of Anita Sarkeesians for neckbeards, but that's what he is. You know, that's why I don't like the guy very much. And I went over all this before starting on the book for a reason. Because it's not just that the background lends important context to this book, it's that I don't like Will Jordan and I don't respect him. Like, not as an author, not as a YouTuber, and not as a person. Like, he's just a fucking crybaby. He's an asshole to almost everyone in his path. He's a coward who only ever gives his audience what they demand to hear. And he's a liar. He's a lazy, bitter reviewer for lazy, bitter people. And that's why a lot of people are going to try and project all that onto me. But the thing is, in spite of all that, his book was just kind of on the back burner for me. You know, it was something I might do one day. But the thing that finally made me commit to this project was this particular tweet he made a while ago. Last year, when the Writers Guild of America was on strike, he publicly mocked one of them for wanting to be paid a decent wage. And that made me think, I wonder how much money this guy makes. So I checked Social Blade, and according to that, the Critical Drinker YouTube channel brings in as much as 596,000 US dollars per year. Now, obviously it's a spectrum, it could be anywhere in there, it's just an estimate, but in my personal experience, it's usually near the high end of that spectrum. And the Social Blade estimate does not include things like Super Chats or YouTube channel memberships. It also doesn't include Patreon, which his page brings in approximately $39,768 per year. At least, it did a few months ago when he still let you see how much his page brought in. Now it's a secret for some reason. That also does not include how much he makes from his other channels, like The Critical Gamer, or like literal several others. It also doesn't include merchandise sales. Speaking of which, you should buy my merch. Check it out. Also doesn't include however much money he makes from his books, which I don't think it's a lot, but it's more than zero. So after running some numbers and thinking it over for a bit, I think that conservatively, this guy makes 800,000 US dollars a year, which is almost 650,000 British pounds, which Critical Drinker is Scottish, if you didn't know. And for context, the average household income in the United Kingdom is 32,300 pounds. So he makes about 20 times that. I know that this guy and most other big YouTubers really try to give off the impression that they're just a regular dude ch chilling and talking about movies. But if you jump on the right-wing grifting train, it's actually very, very lucrative. Hello again to the EFAP crew. You guys got really defensive about that and have spent the last 20 minutes refuting me. Seeing this very wealthy man publicly mock someone for being poor just left a bad taste in my mouth. And some people are going to whine, Oh, it was just a joke. Stop being offended. The thing is, if Jeff Bezos was laughing at a homeless dude, it wouldn't matter if he actually meant it or not. It would still be in poor taste, and it would still make him look like a twat. So I figured, hey, Will Jordan should have his work dissected and picked apart the way he does to everyone else's. After all, if he's really such a storytelling expert, I wouldn't be able to find anything to critique. <laughs> and the thing is, no matter how many positive things I say about this book, and there are a couple of positives, I want to reiterate that, if I dislike it overall, they'll claim that it's purely just because I dislike the author. And they'll claim that I only hate the author because he fights wokeness or whatever from his literal fucking mansion. And again, I know this because they've been saying exactly that for months, ever since I first mentioned I was covering this book. Like, it's an automatic defense mechanism. Not a single brain cell was put to use in the process. All right, here's a few more roasts about the author before I really get going. In his profile picture where he's pretending to drink whiskey, the bot bottle cap is still on. <laughs> which just looks freaking ridiculous. He wears sunglasses most of the time, and at first I thought that was stupid, but then I saw him without them, and I was like, you know what, you should keep those on. Without the sunglasses, he looks like he's possessed by the ghost of a murdered Victorian child. He sometimes refers to himself as a Brit, which, when a Scottish person refers to themselves as a Brit, that means they secretly wish they were English, and nobody should wish they were English. I mean, nothing against English people, obviously. It's not their fault. But still, no one should wish they were English. In the About the Author section of this book, he claims that he was an extra on a movie where he was put through military boot camp in preparation for the role. He doesn't name what movie it is, though. And I'm not saying that's fake, but it does sound really, really fake. There was also the time where he was on a live stream and he 
was acting like everyone has stopped watching Western movies in favor of Japanese ones because Japanese ones aren't infested by wokeness, but he couldn't name a single Japanese film when prompted. Don't believe me? There's a reason people like in the West are starting to draw more and more towards um, you know, Korean or, or Japanese filmmaking. It's precisely because it's a bit different from what we get. Mm. And that's uh, a good what... thing. Yeah, what is the most recent Japanese film or at least um, entertainment that you enjoyed so far? Uh, what am I thinking of? Um, see, a lot of them would be older ones, like Old Boy, for example. Oh, yeah. um, I really enjoyed that one. I know it's not Japanese, but um, yeah, probably stuff like that. Um, you know, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I really like that. And it's like Chinese, I think. Um, but yeah, like it's... Um, okay, that's it. Now, on to the book for real. So, we're gonna start here with the cover. It is a man in a suit being chased by two cars down a road, and he's just running away. Like, just in a straight line, just running directly away from the cars. Not the best strategy. <laughs> it seems like they would catch up pretty quick. Maybe he should, like, go off-road or something, but okay, whatever. He's also wearing a suit in the desert, which doesn't seem very comfortable, and it's also not something that Ryan Drake does at any point throughout the story, <laughs> so I'm not sure why. And also just, and look at all this empty space here. I mean, two-thirds of the cover is just this featureless yellow landscape with, and it's just this sickly yellow color. Like, why? Why do you love yellow so much, Will? Now, I don't have a whole lot to say about the cover. It just makes my eyes bleed. It's bad. So the book starts with Ryan Drake dying. It is May 13th, 2007, somewhere in Iraq. He has been shot and he is now wandering the desert. He falls down, he's about to die, and then he hears a helicopter. Uh, that takes about two pages and then the story, story skips backward about a week. So this was an attempt at doing in medias res, but it doesn't work very well for a couple of reasons. First, at this point, we don't know or care about Ryan Drake. Uh, we still won't care about him by the end of the book, but at least we will know who he is by the end of the book. Uh, second, it's pretty obvious he's not going to die since a helicopter is coming to get him. Like, we find out by the end of that prologue that the helicopter is coming to get him, so we're not worried and thinking, Oh man, is he going to die? I gotta read through 550 goddamn pages to find out. And third, this prologue adds nothing. It's supposed to get us excited and make us wonder what led to this point, but it gives us so little to work with that we're more confused than anything. Who's involved? What happened? What led up to this point? Why is it happening? You, you have to give us a little bit to go on and speculate with if you want to intrigue us, and that's a delicate line to walk, admittedly. Like, you don't want to give us so much that we know everything and there's no mystery, but you also don't want to give us so little that we have no idea what's going on, and that's what happens here. So that was the end of the first prologue. The second prologue takes place seven days earlier in Mosul. It starts with a random Iraqi man who is stuck in traffic, and then he dies in an explosion. We then cut to a CIA field ops center away in Baghdad. A man named Kaminsky is in charge of this place, and they lose control of one of their Predator drones, which is flying over Mosul, for a few minutes, and then once they regain control, they, fire that it, they see that it fired missiles at civilian targets. Tearing his eyes away, Kaminsky looked at Hastings. The young man was pale, a faint sheen of sweat on his forehead. He looked as if he was about to be sick. What is it? Hastings swallowed hard. All three Hellfire missiles have been deployed. Shock and disbelief were reflected in the eyes of every person in the room. Nobody uttered a word. With slow, deliberate care, Kaminsky removed his reading glasses and turned to his subordinate. Pete, better call Langley right now. Okay, so that's not a great Scottish accent, but Neither is Will Jordan's, because it's not a true Scottish accent unless you sound like you're speaking a foreign language. I was in a gang for about a year, two years. It was actually quite a lot of fights when I was jumping about like that. And with that bit I just read, the second prologue is concluded. Like, the people at the CIA center realize something has gone horribly wrong, and so they call their superiors. And it's actually a solid opening. Personally, if I were to rewrite that, I would spend a bit more time with the Iraqis who are experiencing the attack on the ground so we see more of the devastation and we really understand what happened. But other than that, not bad. You know, it got my attention. There, somebody hacked a Predator drone, fired missiles at civilians. That, that's a crazy event. It makes me wonder who has the capability to do that and why they would do it. I, I will admit, 
it leaves a slight sour taste in my mouth because it seems to be saying that the only way civilians could die in a US drone strike is if somebody were trying to make us look bad. <laughs> now we do a pretty good job of that on our own, but overall that is a small issue. So in the next chapter, we meet Ryan Drake for real. Uh, we find out he lives in Washington DC and he's going for a jog one Sunday morning. Uh, the book spends some time going on about how to the trained eye he moves like a trained soldier and he's constantly watching everything so it's really just telling us instead of showing us which, you know, generally a bad idea. This is also when we learn that he's a former British Special Forces soldier and he works for the CIA. And I'm not reading off any passages for this bit because this all takes multiple pages to explain because everything in this book is described in three times as much detail as is necessary, so scenes just drag on. Even ones that should be like really quick and explosive just drag. So I think throughout this whole uh, video I'm going to be reading fewer passages than normal because it would just drag the whole thing out like crazy. Like, remember earlier when I said this was 300 pages worth of story stretched out to 550 pages? Like, that's the main reason why. Everything is dragged out. So Drake gets a call from his boss at the CIA, a guy named Franklin, and he knows that it's nothing good because it's 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Your boss doesn't call you on your day off that early if bad things aren't happening. And Drake doesn't want to come in because it's his day off, but after a long conversation, Franklin finally convinces Drake that it's important and he comes in. He was an outsider here and always just beneath the surface. He felt it. A Brit working for the CIA? Rare enough? and not altogether welcomed by some. He also had no real background in the intelligence game. He was a soldier, not a spook. At least he had been once. Now he occupied a curious middle ground where these hard-won skills were put to the test just by different employers. Again, I should mention that Drake is English, and I think there are rules about foreigners working for government agencies that handle classified information. Like, I'm not saying it's impossible that a guy from North London would wind up in America working for the CIA, but it's unlikely and it requires some justification. And even if the sequels give it, the fact that this book doesn't give it makes this book worse. So when Drake finally reaches the conference room to meet with his boss and some others, the book spends a whole page describing the conference room, which isn't important and never comes back, then another page describing Franklin's appearance and backstory. Basically, he was he's an American, he was a soldier that got wounded in Afghanistan, and it was no longer able to be a soldier, so he came to the CIA. And it spends some more time describing the other guy there who Drake doesn't know yet. Okay, advice for aspiring writers. You need to save long descriptions for stuff that's important or when you want to convey a very specific tone. For example, describing a horrible, violent scene during a battle. You want to let everyone know that not only is this a really big and important moment, but also you want to convey the horror and the shock and the disgust and all of the other feelings that would come with that. When everything is given this much time and this much obnoxious detail, it doesn't just slow down the pace of the story, it doesn't really give you anywhere to go during the big dramatic moments. So when you have big dramatic moments, they just feel the same as everything else. So Drake describes the conference room as being a steady 18 degrees Celsius no matter what the weather is outside, and it's a small detail, but it does make me wonder, why use Celsius? You know, Americans don't use that very often. Like, why, why not have Drake think in Celsius and then mentally correct himself to Fahrenheit? You know, it, it would emphasize how out of place he feels and how he's far away from home and he doesn't really fit in here. You know, like, that's something that they were telling us earlier, but this would be a way to show us. Anyways, the older guy there that Drake doesn't know is named Marcus Kane, and he is the head of the CIA's Special Activities Division, meaning he is in charge of sanctioning black ops missions all over the world. He's a pretty important guy with a lot of power. And if you couldn't figure out that he was evil from the instant that you heard his name was Kane, you shouldn't be left outside unsupervised. During this section, we also find out specifically what Drake's job is. He's head of a special investigations team, which is colloquially, colloquially known as a Shepard team. So basically, Shepard teams track down CIA operatives who have gone missing in some way. You know, they try to figure out, have they been killed? Have they been captured? Have they just run off and gone into hiding, etc. And then they, like, track them down and retrieve them. And then we get a few paragraphs about Drake's military service record, like just... A lot of exposition here, just kind of thrown at you. 
So finally, once we get to the point, Kane shows Drake a photo of a woman, and I'm going to read you the description of that photo real quick. That's a lie, it won't be real quick, but I'm going to read it. It was a woman. She was Caucasian, with a pale complexion and blue eyes. Her hair was light blonde, cut short and styled in a simple side parting that left a strand falling across her face. She wore no makeup. She didn't need it. She was beautiful, strikingly beautiful in fact. Her mouth was full and rounded, her cheekbones high, her nose narrow and finely chiseled. Her straight, clean jawline tapered down to a firm, well-defined chin. The shape, symmetry, and arrangement of her features combined in elegant harmony to create a face that was almost captivating in its perfection. Her age was difficult to tell, but there was something about her face that had lost the softer curves of youth and assumed the more definite lines of maturity. But what she noticed most of all were her eyes, icy blue and vividly intense. They held his gaze and wouldn't let go. Even in a photograph, they seemed to stare right through him. Never in his life had he seen eyes like those. God, I hate doing that impression, but <laughs> I'm committed to the bit. <laughs> that dragged on, didn't it? Like, imagine an entire book written like that, and that's what this is. Like, I'm gonna try not to harp on that too, too much, but it really is what drags this book down. Like, more than anything else, just the shitty way it's written. If that was not there, or if, hell, if it was just not as bad as it is, then I think this book would be mediocre instead of trash. But as it stands, it is trash. So Kane tells Drake that the woman is codenamed Maris. We, we later learn her real name is Anya, so I'm mostly going to be referring to her as Anya throughout this video. And Kane wants him to break Maris slash Anya out of a Siberian prison named Katirgin? Katirgin? I, I'm, I'm not sure how to say that, I don't speak Russian. Now, he doesn't say why he wants Anya to be free, because she's been there for four years and they've known the whole time, and, but this operation must also be secret, because they're going into Russian territory, and if Drake or his team get caught, then they won't get any outside support. Like, they are going to be disavowed, and the government's going to say, we had nothing to do with that. And Kane tells him that because Drake is British, they can claim there's no connection, even though he is an official CIA employee, which doesn't make any kind of sense, but sure, whatever. And he eventually agrees because uh, Kane says that it will get the dishonorable discharge off his record and make him easier to employ. Because if you're unfamiliar, getting dishonorably discharged from the military when it comes to trying to find another job afterwards is not a whole lot different than having a felony conviction on your record. And again, we never find out why Drake was dishonorably discharged, but... We know that Drake doesn't really want to work here at the CIA, but this is the only job he could get. Like, and he only was able to get it because he's friends with Franklin. So after a bit of back and forth, Drake does agree to do the job. Now the next chapter is Anya in prison. It refers to her as Prisoner 62 a bunch, but you know, again, I'm just calling her Anya. She is exercising because she's been in solitary confinement for four years, and she's thinking about how awful the prison is. It had been worse when she first arrived here, before they learned the kind of grudging, reluctant respect they had for her now. In those first few months, they had tried to beat her down, tried to subjugate and break her, but she didn't react like the other prisoners. She didn't cower in fear. She didn't meekly submit. She fought back. All too often, they had come away with gashes and bruises of their own, and more than one unfortunate guard had to be carried out by his comrades, moaning and bleeding. She could fight like a wild animal if the need was upon her, lashing out with a ferocity that surprised even her jailers, and refusing to stay down until she was physically unable to stand. Whoa, 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 hold on. I have seen plenty of research saying that a woman could never possibly fight men and win. The problem is, you're always going to have a tough time selling a fight between a man and a woman on screen, for obvious reasons. Men are generally bigger, stronger and more robust, with denser and heavier bones, stronger muscles, broader shoulders, longer limbs and superior upper body strength. Or maybe he was just telling his brain dead fans what they wanted to hear. Yeah, this chapter really doesn't do anything except let us know that Anya hates the prison and it really sucks to be there, which isn't news, but okay, fine. So back in DC, Drake is looking over plans of the prison and he's contemplating how to get in. He's also completely obsessed with Anya's photo because she's just so effortlessly gorgeous. Now, after some deliberation, he decides to do a ha-ho jump, which is high altitude, high opening. Basically, they fly over the ocean, and then 40 miles east from the prison, they will jump out, open parachutes, and then just drift over to the prison. 
which is not really how that works. Like from that far away, any gust of wind could blow you miles off course, but that's what they decide to do. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes rule of cool can win out. Like sometimes being cool and entertaining is more important than realism. But this book does a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. And when they're doing stuff that should be cool, it doesn't really come across as cool. So it all adds up after a while. Like it's doing all of this unrealistic stuff and it's trying to act like a gritty spy thriller. So it's just, it's just distracting. So once they decide on a plan, they try to think of who they'll need for their team. They need a guy named Jonas Dietrich to translate, and he speaks Russian, but he's also an asshole and Drake doesn't like him. He's also a complete dipshit, and they give an anecdote about him getting some of his teammates killed during a mission, which raises the question, why allow him to work here at all? Like, this guy isn't just an asshole, he's incompetent. Like, cut him loose. You, you can't have incompetence in this line of work. Like. You can get away with being an asshole if you're good at your job. A good example is Dr. House. Thank you so much. I gotta get you a gift or something. Sometimes the best gift is the gift of never seeing you again. You can't get away with being bad at your job. Anyways, Drake calls Dietrich, and then Dietrich hangs up. And then he calls again and offers the job, and Dietrich demands triple the normal rate, and eventually they do agree to take him on. They also recruit a demolitions expert named Cole Mason and an electronics expert slash hacker named Kira Frost. And while he's thinking about bringing Frost along, Drake thinks to himself that the prison strikes him as a low-tech place, but he wants her around just in case. Like, he just, it just strikes him as a low-tech place. He doesn't actually check. He's just going on vibes. Okay. Now, it's mentioned that Frost is very small, she's barely 100 pounds, but Drake has seen her take on men twice her size in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Men are generally bigger, stronger, and more robust, with denser and heavier bones, stronger muscles. They also recruit a sniper named John Keegan, and that is his entire personality and his entire role in the story. He is a sniper. He is good at shooting things from far away. So, back to the prison. There is a guard called Bastard, because Anya doesn't actually know any of the guards' names, she just gives them nicknames, and all the prisoners hate and fear Bastard. Like, he torments them physically and mentally all the time. Like, there's an anecdote about how he made them all go barefoot out in the snow and then threw out one pair of boots and made them all fight over it. Like, he abuses prisoners all the time, just for fun, and he regularly sexually assaults Anya. And that happens in this chapter. Like, yeah, pretty much all that happens in this chapter, actually, is just him sexually assaulting her. And to be honest with you, in this case, I'm not saying you can't write that, I'm just saying it might be better off screen. Because later on, spoiler alert, she does take revenge on him, and just imagining the torment she went through, instead of knowing specifically what it was, might honestly be more horrifying. So then there's a short chapter where all of the specialists I mentioned earlier show up and they meet with Drake, and nothing happens. Uh, there's a lot of chapters like that, actually. So we immediately go back to the prison, and Anya thinks about how much she hates this place, but she won't give up and kill herself. No such feelings stirred within her now. The only anger she felt was towards herself and her body. Her soft and vulnerable body that could be so easily hurt. Had she been born a man, she could have endured places like Katirgen with ease. I feel dumber having read that. Like, do, does Will Jordan think that he could survive in a prison like this just by virtue of being a man? Because I think he does. So Drake goes over the plan with his team. They are going to parachute in, neutralize, gar neutralize the guards in security, find Anya, and then leave. The prison has very few guards because the heroes need an easy task to complete. Like, the real security feature is that it's in the middle of the Arctic, far away from anything. Like, even if prisoners escaped uh, over the walls, like, where would they go? And the thing is, the heroes here are outside the prison. They have access to things like planes and helicopters and cars, you know. The isolation doesn't mean much. Like, if this story was about the prisoners themselves and the heroes were trying to escape from the prison, then that would work as dramatic tension, but here it doesn't. So Kane tells them not to underestimate Anya because she's dangerous and they should never, under any circumstances, let her get access to any weapons. And later, Drake has Frost, the hacker, remember, do a search on Anya's identity and she finds nothing. Also, it's kind of annoying, but for a large chunk of this book, it just switches back and forth between calling her Frost and calling her Kira. Like, you pick one, please. It's annoying. 
Now, Drake is like really concerned and wondering, oh man, they aren't telling us anything about this. I wonder what's going on. Who is this Anya lady? Or sorry, Morris at this point is what he's still calling her. But again, they work for the CIA. Being in the dark about some of the details of their mission really shouldn't be new for them. You know, and while they're going over this, Dietrich says, Kane will sell us out. And it's supposed to be, you know, something. <laughs> like, again, not surprising. Like, they already know at this stage the CIA will deny involvement if they're captured. So throwing all this out there really just makes the characters seem stupid and a little bit whiny. Throughout this whole beginning section, like not after the beginning for whatever reason, but throughout this whole beginning section, Drake complains a couple of times about not making much money. But then we learn that he bought a two bedroom house in central Washington, DC. That's an expensive place to live. All right, cost of living there is high. I think he's doing all right for himself, just saying. Like, he doesn't have a money problem. He has a spending problem. <laughs> And the book also lets us know that he has a drinking problem. A quick trip to the fridge freezer saw him return with a handful of ice wrapped in a kitchen towel. Holding the ice bag against his aching hand, he saw his gaze drawn to the half-empty bottle of Talisker whiskey sitting a few feet further down the breakfast bar. It had been full last night. Drake's drinking problem and possible alcoholism comes up a few more times, but it, it never affects anything. There is never a moment where he gets drunk when he shouldn't and causes trouble. There's no scene where he struggles with the urge to drink. It, nothing. Like, it's not a character flaw if it doesn't actually cause the characters any issues, guys. So we finally hear a little bit more about the explosion in Iraq from the beginning. Like, we don't learn anything new about it, but we see it on the news and they are pretending it was an accident. They're saying it was a gas line explosion. And Drake has an email from his sister and he thinks about how he misses her and he misses home. And then Frost visits and says she found nothing on Morris slash Anya, again, which we already knew. But she did learn that Morris is the name of a goddess of war from Baltic mythology. And then, finally, they fly out to Alaska, and then from Alaska they fly out to Russia. And while they're in the plane, just sitting around, waiting to arrive, we get some interesting lines. Keegan was more superstitious than a gypsy, and wore the necklace on every operation he took part in, either around his neck or tucked into a pouch in his webbing. Nothing on earth would persuade him to leave it behind. Well, that's extremely fucking racist, but okay. So while they're flying, they also learn that a storm is blowing in and it's gonna cause trouble, but they're pushing ahead. <laughs> that's stupid! Use your common sense! I'm not sure why. I feel like they could wait a day or two till it passes. Like, they, they've grounded their drones so the person hacking them can't take them over and blow more stuff up in the interim. Like, I, I get they want to do this fast, but... You also want to do it right, just saying. And team member uh, Mason, the demolitions guy, he suggests killing Dietrich because... So then we have another Anya chapter where nothing happens. And then finally, we're more than 90 pages in and the mission finally starts. If it had taken 50 or 60 pages to get to this point, I think it would have been fine, but needing to spend this much time parsing over repetitive information and drawn out scenes, I'm really surprised more Thriller fans didn't give up before finishing this thing. So, anyways, they all jump out, open parachutes, it takes a long time for them to drift over to the prison, and Drake worries that they won't make it, and he can only pray the wind is enough, because they... They didn't plan this well. They didn't plan this well at all, which is a common theme with the heroes in this book, and the villains for that matter. As they're drifting in, they see a guard in a tower, and Keegan shoots him, which... Not an impossible shot, they're pretty far away, but sure, he, he can hit him. But the thing is, they say that no one else noticed because he had a suppressor on his rifle, and a suppressor doesn't muffle the gunshot that much. Like, there's nothing around there. It would echo pretty far. People would hear. So they land on the roof, they discard their gear, and then they incinerate it so there's no evidence left behind. And from here on, the mission is almost fine. Like, this section of the book is almost fine. Like... Some stupid stuff drags it down, but at least the story is, in fact, moving. You know, they, they are moving in, they see a security camera, they shoot it, and they specifically describe the spent shell casing hitting the ground, and they leave it behind, which is stupid considering you're trying not to leave evidence behind, but sure, whatever. And Frost disables the cameras really, really fast. You know, she, she does it the way hacking works in movies, where they just kind of tap away at the keyboard for a few seconds and go, I'm in. And then finally, Drake and Dietrich go to retrieve Anya while the others watch their back. They don't know what specific cell she's held in, so they decide to take a guard prisoner and ask where Anya is. 
And Drake tells Dietrich, remember, no English when he's talking to him. And was that like a, was that an intentional modern warfare reference or something? Uh, okay, whatever. So a lone guard is patrolling down a hall. They hold him at gunpoint, tell him to stay quiet. He does stay quiet. And they don't know who it is, but we reading it know that it is Bastard, the guard that was tormenting Anya earlier. And D Dietrich is acting kind of hot-headed and amateurish, which Drake think is, thinks is weird. Uh, but they do get Bastard to take them to Anya's cell. And then it cuts away to another guard wondering where Bastard is. And his real name is Lopukhin? Lopukhin? I think. I think that's how you say that? Again, I don't speak Russian. Yes, the heroes didn't think that other guards would be there. They didn't consider that maybe these prison guards have a system in place that isn't completely stupid. You know, just assume that they don't communicate with each other and none will notice if one goes missing. I'm sure a lot of prisons do that. So they arrive at Anya's cell and they open it and she seems suspicious. She doesn't know what's going on. Drake is you know, shocked to see her in her current state because you know, she's not looking good. It might have been more shocking for us, the audience, if we didn't already know what Anya had been going through and what she looked like. Like, I guess it's not a big deal, but like, imagine how much more shocking it would be if like, Drake opened the door and he sees her and she's a lot skinnier and she's got bruises and signs of injury and stuff, you know, that would be a lot more impactful. She's suspicious of what's going on, but when she sees Bastard, she just snaps. Like, she grabs Drake's knife and immediately kills Bastard with it. Like, she... It's too fast for Drake or Dietrich to react. Men are generally bigger, stronger, and more robust. We know why she did it. And frankly, I think it's understandable and completely justified for her to kill this guy. It's not smart during this, given the circumstances, because, you know, if they make noise, they will get caught. But it's totally understandable why she did that. However, again, it would be a lot more impactful if we didn't know exactly what happened and our imaginations ran wild. Or, even better, imagine if this was the first time we saw Anya. This was our intro to her character. Like, we see her in this cell, she looks all sickly and thin and everything, but she's still that fast and that deadly. You know, it'd be a much better intro to the character, and it would have saved time. So Drake and Dietrich hold her at gunpoint until she calms down, and then they leave. And, well, before they get the chance to leave, they notice that Bastard's radio is going off, and they realize, oh, other guards noticed he's missing, and they're becoming concerned. And... Drake thinks, hey, Dietrich, was, he searched that guy. How did he miss his radio? That comes back in a minute, but it's not important now. So Drake speaks to Anya in English, violating his own rule, and the prisoners begin to wake up because they hear a commotion going on. And they, they start calling out, making a scene, and they're alerting guards to what's going on. And now Drake and the others have to leave quickly. So uh, a guard investigates what's going on, and they see him, and they shoot at him but he, they, he manages to reach an alarm and set it off first. You, you'd think an amazing hacker could disable those, but whatever. Uh, and then other guards come in, and them and the Shepard team start shooting at each other. They kill some of the guards, the guards injure some of them, like Dietrich gets shot in the leg. It just The fighting escalates, and there's no easy way to put this, but they demolish a guard tower with a claymore mine, because this is a stealth mission. Also, a claymore mine cannot demolish a concrete and steel building, like... It could break down thin walls made of like wood and plaster, but it's not going to break down a concrete building. And Anya actually tries to kill Dietrich because he's slowing them down. He got shot in the leg, but Drake stops her. And again, the prisoners are running wild. A riot is starting. It's like, it should be an exciting scene, but it just drags on too much and... I don't care that much. They all meet up in a tower and they decide to rappel down the side of the tower to escape. And one man, Mason, while he's rappelling down, he gets shot and it looks like he might not make it. But after spending a page explaining how his injuries make it unlikely he can get down, he, he, he gets down. And he, him being shot doesn't actually <laughs> lead anywhere. And then we get a few more pages of everyone else rappelling down with nothing going on. <laughs> Bro, you can't stretch tension out forever. Like, you either have to make things happen, or you make it short and snappy. Like, if you stretch it out forever, it loses potency very quick. And then they, a helicopter lands nearby, and they reach it, and they fly away. While they're flying away, they treat their wounds. Dietrich injects himself with morphine and tends his own wound. And the others just let him do this. That's stupid! Use your common sense. Like, yeah, what, what could go wrong? Being sleepy while sewing up a gunshot wound. 
that sounds like a great idea in this gritty, realistic spy thriller. And uh, Anya actually grabs a knife and takes Frost hostage with it, demands to know what's going on. Drake talks her down. He tells her they're CIA, they're going to an American Air Force base, and he tells her that it's the year 2007. And she realizes how long she was kept in solitary confinement, and she gets upset, and she lets Frost go without hurting her. And she trusts Drake because he seems trustworthy. <laughs> I'm not joking. In her thoughts, that's how she justifies it. Just, yeah, this guy seems trustworthy. So they finally arrive back at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska, and they start recuperating. Drake is drinking because he smuggled a bottle of whiskey on the flight from Virginia. Number one, how did he do that? They search you. They make sure you don't take contraband like that. Number two, why? Like, you're allowed to have liquor on military bases, unless there's some rule I'm not aware of, to Elmendorf specifically. And even if you're not able to get it on the base, there's stuff right near the base, or places right near the base where you could go and get it. Like, this is just putting on the aesthetics of having an alcoholic protagonist without having reason to. Drake really doesn't come across as an alcoholic here. It's just throwing in an occasional, oh yeah, and he was drinking. So Drake calls his sister and tells her that his job, which she, she just thinks he's a security consultant and that's why he travels a lot, uh, but he tells her that it's a cover and he hints at more and he decides he's gonna go on vacation back home soon. Why would he tell her about spy stuff? Because he's dumb, you know? Like, again, this is a situation where if you tell people who aren't supposed to know about this, you could go to actual prison, and he's just doing it. So we cut to the bosses, Franklin and Kane, being briefed about Anya's health. She, she got a checkup from a doctor. There's several pages about it, <laughs> describing uh, assaults and stuff. And again, we, we already know this, so you don't need to go over it that much. Just give us a sentence or two so we can hear what they're hearing, and it's fine. Now, Kane seems to know and actually care about Anya, so he's distraught at her state, uh, but he doesn't want to talk to her himself, so he sends Franklin in to talk to her, and he prepares to tell Anya that Kane is actually retired. Like, Kane tells him, hey, just lie and say I'm retired. Uh, so Franklin goes in, and she is upset with him. And he tells the lie about the Kane retirement, and she knows that he's lying because she has amazing body language reading. You know, despite barely interacting with anyone for four years. Like, <laughs> being devoid of social interaction for four entire years will decay things like reading body language, you know? Extended stays in solitary confinement can cause a lot of problems. Like, it also causes things like anxiety, depression, anger, cognitive disturbances, perceptual distortions, obsessive thought, paranoia, and psychosis. But... Sure, Anya is still in tip-top shape and can tell everything about you with 100% accuracy just by looking at you. Makes perfect sense. She notices Franklin's back problems and deduces that he was in the military and got wounded, and he gets upset, and so does she, and then he leaves and goes back to Kane, and Kane says, Oh, that was all part of the plan. Honestly, a weird plan. Even after finishing the book, I'm not sure what the point of that was. So, th there's no segue into this, but... We find out that Dietrich is a heroin addict. Like, that, that's why he screwed up on both this mission when he forgot to get Bastard's radio and on previous ones. Like, he, he has a heroin problem. And he's about to inject himself, but then he feels bad for a minute, and then he crushes a syringe underfoot, and he vows to stop. And that's the end. Like, it's the quickest introduction and conclusion of a character arc I have ever read. <laughs> like, just like Drake, his addiction does not affect him going forward. And... Sure, there are sequels to this book, to be fair, there are some sequels, and maybe it comes up then, but if you're going to introduce it in this book, you should do something with it in this book. So Drake talks to Kane, and Kane finally explains the whole situation with Maris slash Anya. Like, this is when he tells him her real name is Anya, and she was born in Lithuania back in the Soviet Union. And one day when she was 18 years old, she defected to the United States, she went on a whole bunch of Black Ops missions, was really successful about it, and then she went dark one day, and they later found out she got caught by the Russian FSB, that's the Federal Security Bureau, and that's when she got sent to prison. Then they tell Drake that somebody out there can hack into Predator drones, and he's the one that fired missiles and caused the explosions from the beginning of the book, and he actually sent out a message demanding that they free her from prison. And now that she's out, he will send them further instructions. Uh, the guy who's been hacking the drones is named Dominic Monroe, and he is Anya's protege. Years ago, for whatever reason, he tried to kill her. She took his eye out during the fight, 
and then he went to prison for it. But six months before the book began, he managed to escape. And honestly, Anya's whole backstory here is kind of overwritten, and there's still more to come. Now, Kane wants Anya's help tracking down Monroe, and because she seems to trust Drake, he wants Drake to work with him on this as well. And Drake agrees to help because Anya's eyes, like he's, he's just obsessed with her eyes. He, he spends the whole book being weirdly obsessed with her eyes. And then him and her spend a page describing each other. I'm literally, I'm not joking. They spend an entire page doing that. Now, they tell her about this and she agrees to help find Monroe, but only if Drake helps. And she also wants back into the CIA and just everyone agrees. But they also implant her with a tracker in her arm. So they all fly back down to Washington, they have Anya handcuffed in a car, and they're driving it to CIA headquarters so that they can, you know, get started on trying to find Monroe and arrest him again, or kill him. And Drake gets a call from his sister, and he answers it, and who's on the other line? Monroe! And this is a very dumb moment, because Drake just has his cell phone on him, and he has it turned on while he's working, I feel like top secret secret jobs would make him leave that at home. Like, I have worked in places that were not top secret, and we couldn't take our phones with us because they didn't want us recording patented processes. Even in 2007, with more primitive smartphones, CIA would have to worry about him taking audio recordings, pictures, video recordings, and location tracking. Like, they would probably just make him leave his cell phone literally at his house, and he couldn't even take it to Alaska let alone to Russia. Like, I imagine it was just in his pocket that whole time. <laughs> if Drake's phone had gone off during that, others would probably make him not answer it, and then they would take it away and reprimand him for breaking rules like this. So anyways, we find out that Monroe has Drake's sister, her name is Jessica, by the way, he has her hostage, and he will kill her if Drake doesn't follow his instructions. And he wants him to break out Anya as she's being transported in this convoy of cars. And Drake agrees, but he's not happy about it. Monroe's plan is to pull a garbage truck right in front of the car that Anya's in, which separates them from the front of the convoy, and then pull a garbage truck behind them to cut off others and prevent them from, you know, stopping them. And then Drake takes someone's gun after this happens and forces the driver to take him off route and then makes everyone except him and Anya get out and then he drives off. And it's mentioned specifically that the street is empty except for them in central Washington, D.C., in the middle of the day. Fat fucking chance. Have any of you ever seen the traffic in D.C.? It's bad. Like, there's no way the streets would be empty, and there's no way they'd be able to get away that quickly. Like, it would be completely impossible to coordinate anything like this. Like, there's zero chance of not only them being able to drive away, but also being able to get the garbage trucks to come in at the exact right moment and time everything perfectly. And they would get stuck unless you had police blocking off roads specifically for this, but you, you, they don't have that. And then immediately after this, immediately after Drake and Anya drive away, they cut to others and they are unable to properly pursue them because of traffic. This whole scene is just a very poor attempt at making the villain look smart and three steps ahead of everybody by just making reality bend around him. So Drake goes to a parking garage where Monroe has a car waiting and the spot right next to that car is conveniently empty, so he doesn't have to, you know, look around for one. Again, it's the middle of the day in D.C., so the parking lot should be full, but whatever. And he has Anya cut the tracker out of her arm. So the tracker was introduced and then immediately taking out, taken out of the story, rendering the whole thing completely pointless. And this is supposed to be a fast-paced action scene, so like, cut the fat, guys. Cut the fat or it drags on and it stops being exciting. And... I mean, I have to mention this, like, she doesn't just cut the tracker out, she has to cut her arm open and then yank the device out with pliers. Jesus, don't you hurt? Drake couldn't help asking. She didn't look up, but he saw a blonde eyebrow raised. Unfortunately, I do. Oh, fuck off! That line hurt me. That, that line hurt me so much. So they drive off in the new car, and the CIA is left with the tracker just on the floor. And if she was really smart, Anya would have taken the tracker and thrown it in or on another car so that she could throw off the trail further, but okay, sure, whatever. And then the good guys, while they're searching for them, find out that all the cameras are disabled and there's no security guards down there, which is convenient. 
You know, an escaped prisoner was able to set up this whole elaborate plan completely by himself. And we learn later that he, Monroe does have outside help helping him with this. But somebody should still stop and realize that this is kind of suspicious, you know? Because they don't seem like super spies if they're just going along with all this and taking it at face value. Monroe calls again, and he says that Anya was looking for something when she got captured four years ago, and he wants her and Drake to go and retrieve it. And that's stupid. Like, it would have been a lot easier for him to wait until Anya was in custody, and then call Drake and force him to help. You know, that way, it's less likely for either Drake or Anya to get killed while trying to escape. Like, they just need to interrogate her for needed information, and she trusts Drake at least, so, like, they could find out what's needed, and then Monroe could, again, keep Drake's sister hostage, and Drake would have to tell him all the necessary information so he can find what he's looking for. And what is he looking for? Well, four years ago, Anya was searching for evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and she was set to meet an Iraqi intelligence officer when the FSB caught her. And Anya thinks that they caught her and arrested her because they were trying to cover up their tracks. They were involved in this somehow, and they don't want people knowing that they gave Iraq nuclear material. So that's what Monroe wants her to go find, and what is it with shitty right-wing thrillers and insisting that, no, Iraq totally did have nukes? Like, we later learn, in this book at least, that they only sort of had nukes, but in this, and in True Allegiance by Ben Shapiro, they have that same plot line. It's, it's weird. So they decide to find Anya's old contact in the Iraqi intelligence service, and then hopefully they can track down what Monroe wants. Meanwhile, Dietrich and the others are tasked with finding Drake, which is dumb, because they know the guy, they would be compromised, you know? Like, people would be wondering, like, oh, did they help Drake escape? Can we trust them to do what must be done if they catch him? Like, no, they would send somebody else after him. They would, bre they would get all these guys and interrogate them and get all the information they needed, and they would send somebody else after him to handle it. So after driving for a few hours south, uh, Drake stops for gas and he buys food at a rural gas station. He can't imitate an American accent to save his life, apparently, so the cashier notices that he's English. And the cashier doesn't say anything to him, uh, they just notice, oh, that guy has a weird accent, they perk up a little bit, and instead of just saying thank you and leaving, Drake says that, oh, I'm on vacation with my wife, which, first of all, it's dumb because you're making yourself stand out more in the cashier's mind. When the kid's eyes showed interest, he pasted on a fake grin. We're on vacation for a couple of weeks heading down to New Orleans. Second, wouldn't he say that they were on holiday for a couple of weeks? You know, it's just, just an odd choice of words, not a, not a big deal, I guess, but still, you'd think. And third, why can a spy not do the accent of a country he's lived in for several years? Ryan Drake is bad at blending in, and he's bad at being a spy. <laughs> so outside, where Anya is waiting, some men sexually harass her, and a fight starts. One of them pulls a knife, and she flashes back to prison and nearly kills him with it, but Drake stops her at the last second, and then they drive off. And then we get a few pages of Kane and Franklin being ineffectual, and they're going, oh, we have no idea where they could have fled to, and it adds nothing, and it really just makes these guys seem like less of a threat as villains. It would be so, so much better if we were just seeing everything from Drake's perspective right now, because then we'd be paranoid and unsure of things. We'd be thinking, like, Okay, how much do the people pursuing him know? How close are they to finding them? Like, it would give every scene an air of danger. It, like, imagine if they're wandering through a crowd and they're wondering if somebody in the crowd is after you, and they're always looking over their shoulder. Anyways, Drake is upset with Anya for making a scene, and she mopes about it for a bit, and she just wonders, like, what have I become? Like a shitty young adult protagonist who can't handle being powerful and special. <laughs> like, Anya really doesn't feel like a hardened killer but this also doesn't feel like it's adding any dimension to her character. So Dietrich manages to find some convenient camera footage of Drake's car leaving the garage, and they don't get the plate number, but they do get the make and model and color of the car, which means that the earlier bit with, oh, there's no security footage, we don't know what, what happened to them or where they went, that bit is now pointless and it only delayed the bad guys by like two hours. Especially since right after this, they hear about Anya fighting those two men and they go down to the gas station, so they didn't need the new footage. 
This is why editing is so important. A good editor would have told Will Jordan that that was redundant, especially in a book this long. And I know what you're thinking. Like, a lot of you are probably thinking, like, okay, he just self-published this, like most YouTubers do. But no, this was actually traditionally published. Like, an actual company with, like, standards and shit looked at this and decided it was acceptable to print. Which makes it a lot funnier. <laughs> at least to me it does. So Drake and Anya check into a motel, and Anya pays for it, and she uses a southern accent so she doesn't stand out. And Drake is just baffled and shocked that a secret agent who speaks multiple languages could use a fake accent. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! And then they have a whole conversation about how she could possibly learn to use a southern accent. Like, literally, just have him say, good job, and then move on. This is stupid. Like, there's so much shit in this book, which is just dumb and makes no sense. Not long after this, Anya showers off and is just, like, casually naked in front of Drake, and he gawks a little bit and spends an entire page describing her body. Uh, and then she goes, oh, it's okay, you can look. Like, <laughs> again, this woman who spent years being sexually abused and has regular flashbacks to the times that she was assaulted by men is fine being nude in front of a near stranger. Why is that? Because... The author of this book is both horny and a bad writer. Anyway, she sends an email to the Iraqi agent they're looking for, his codename is Typhoon, and she tells Drake about her falling out with Monroe. Apparently, he literally tried to kill her for no reason. Like, there's, that's it? She's like, yeah, he, he just tried to kill me one time, and then I fought back and nearly killed him, and then he went to prison. So, that makes her a lot less interesting as a character. Just throwing that out there. Like, if Monroe had tried to kill her because she screwed up somehow, or she did something bad to him, or if she betrayed him, or mistook him for a double agent or something and tried to kill him, and then he tried to kill her in response, like, that would give her an actual flaw. Just saying. And anyways, uh, despite the email, they get no response from Typhoon. They realize, though, that they are going to have to go to Iraq to find this guy, so they need money and passports, and Anya knows somebody. So they go down to Daytona Beach in Florida. And they go to a mall to pick up new clothes. Apparently, it'll help with meeting whoever Anya wants to see. Uh, but then when she's in a crowd, she has a panic attack because she's not used to being around people anymore. And then they leave. And we never actually find out what she wanted new clothes for. So, you know, that scene was boring bullshit. In fact, this whole section of the book is just boring bullshit. Like, there's nothing new I haven't already criticized. There's no setup for later. There's no new character developments or anything. It's just boring stuff that we are already familiar with, so at least I can go over it quickly. So Anya is, like, excited and makes Drake stop the car while they're driving by an abandoned section of beach. Even though it's springtime in Florida, so that beach should really be packed, but whatever. And then she runs off into the surf for a minute, and she's sad and ashamed at being weak, and she cries a little bit, and then she goes back to Drake. And then finally, Typhoon responds to them. Which is not something I was, like, super excited for, but it's a hell of a lot more interesting than everything else going on right now. So, Typhoon says he's willing to work with them and to meet him in Iraq. Nowhere specific, just Iraq, but again, Anya used to work with the guy. I assume she knows a more specific location, because they do go to a more specific location later. And also, while she's talking with him, Anya explains how, Oh yeah, I was in prison and working for the CIA for a long time, and like, she gives him way too much information even though she has no idea who's monitoring the communications here, but whatever. Uh, so then we cut to Jessica, Drake's sister, remember, being held captive somewhere in the desert, and she sees Monroe, doesn't know his name, she just knows him as a guy with a glass eye. <laughs> because, yeah, it's a spy novel where the villain has a glass eye, like it was written by a frickin' ten-year-old. Then we cut to Frost and Dietrich, and Frost knows that Dietrich does heroin and doesn't report him because he's still useful, but she wants him to resign when this is over. And I just need to point out, we're 320 pages in, and we're still firmly in Act 2 of this story. Like, this book really should be wrapping up by now, but there's just so much stuff that could be cut altogether, and so much stuff that couldn't be cut but could be trimmed down, because it's just so stretched out beyond being entertaining, and we're still firmly in the middle of the slog. Again, the book really could be wrapping up by this point, and it would be maybe not a great story, but it would at least be a tight and a somewhat exciting thriller. Anyways, down in Florida, Anya has a storage locker with a gun, some money, and some fake IDs in it, including a passport for her, but no passport for Drake. So they decide they're just gonna find somebody who looks like him and then steal his passport and use that. 
and then they go to a hotel bar and they just find a guy who looks a lot like Drake. Isn't that awfully convenient? <laughs> like, what, what's the saying? Coincidences to get your heroes into trouble are fine, but coincidences to get them out of trouble are cheating. Yeah, that, that's, the cool, that's the line. Seriously, like, it's just that convenient. The heroes didn't have to work for it at all. Perfect. Anya decided. He's the right age. He's wealthy. He's alone and approachable. And he is British. Drake frowned. And how can you tell all that? His suit comes from Seville Row, and he is making no effort to talk to anyone. British men are no good at small talk. She added with a significant look at Drake. He has been drinking spirits for a while, so he isn't planning to meet anyone, especially not a woman. And I see the mark of a wedding ring on his hand. Either he is divorced or he took it off tonight. Either way, he is the one. Once he invites me back to his room, I'll take his passport and meet you back at our suite. She's jumping to a lot of conclusions about this guy, but because it's a shitty spy novel, she is 100% correct. Although I will say the line about British men being bad at small talk and then her pointedly looking at Drake was kind of funny. So anyways, she does go back to this guy's room. He thinks they're about to have sex, but then she robs him at gunpoint and nothing goes wrong. You know, you'd think the book would just skip ahead to afterwards, but nope, we get a whole chapter describing Anya and the guy, his, his name is Lewis, going to the room and then Lewis getting excited about, about having sex with this lady and then her pulling the gun on him, asking if he's married, frightening him, agreeing not to kill him, tying him up, not finding his passport on him, guessing that his passport is in the hotel safe, figuring out the combination to the hotel safe, then stealing his passport and leaving. And the whole book is like that. When she gets back, Drake is drunk and they're both kind of horny, but there is no smashing. Drake really shouldn't be getting drunk right now. He's no more responsible than Dietrich, but we're supposed to condemn Dietrich for his substance abuse, but we're supposed to forgive Drake for his. It's just, I don't know. It's not focused on enough for it to be a major problem, but protagonist-centered morality does irk me a lot. Anyways, Anya and Drake go through security and get on a plane to Saudi Arabia with no issues. Like, the book tries to convince us that we're tense and we're wondering what might happen, but really it just adds a few pages of a TSA agent squinting over Drake's stolen passport. Not long after this, Lewis manages to escape from his room and he goes to the police, and then Dietrich and Frost show up and they interview him and he relays the entire scene from earlier in about the same amount of detail that we got earlier, rendering that earlier scene even more pointless than it already was. I swear to God, this book is like spending an entire day with someone, and then they describe everything to you afterwards in real time, and you keep telling them, yeah, I remember, you don't need to tell me about that, but they ignore you and continue relaying all the events you were there for. That's what this book is like, I swear to Christ. So they flag Drake's passport, and they learn that he is, again, flying to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And then their plane lands, and they have no issues, and then they rent a car, and Anya drives, and they head off to the Iraqi border. Which, in 2007, women driving in Saudi Arabia was illegal. Like, hell, this book came out in 2012. It was still illegal in 2012. So th them letting Anya drive is a good way to get arrested. <laughs> You know, you're only supposed to break one law at a time. If you break more than one, you're gonna get caught. It's even specifically mentioned that some people nearby give them dirty looks and shout when they see a woman driving. Like, someone would probably do something. Call the police or stop them themselves. Like, you know, it would put a spoke in the wheels of this mission, basically. But on top of that, they really should have been stopped at the airport. Because again, Dietrich flagged Drake's fake passport and all he had to do was tell them to stop Lewis and whoever was with him. Like, they have all his info. And it's not like he was too late. It's specifically mentioned to be an 18-hour flight, which left at 9 in the morning, and Dietrich put out the alert in the afternoon. We don't get an exact time, but it was only a couple hours later. And the only explanation we get for why they weren't stopped is that the Saudis weren't being cooperative, even though the Saudis and the Americans our allies. So Dietrich and Frost arrive in Saudi Arabia. They meet a man from Saudi intelligence whose name is Tariq and they go off with him. Uh, right afterwards, he has a stern talk with them and he says, hey, if there are terrorists here, my government wants to know about it. That don't make no sense. Then you should have stopped these guys at the airport, you fucking idiot. The heroes really only get this far because the villains are all idiots. The heroes are idiots too, but the villains are idiots. Like everyone's just stupid. Everyone in this book is so fucking stupid. Yeah, Tariq sends them off with a subordinate named Lieutenant Rahul Alamin. 
He's not really important, but I do want to point out that none of the Arabic names have hyphens in them for some reason. You know, normally it'd be like Alamin with, with a hyphen in the middle, but it's not in this book. Maybe that's just a British grammar thing, I, but I don't know. I, I felt the need to mention it. Anyways, Drake bloviates about his dad for two entire pages and how he misses his dad and how his dad is dead. And it, I guess it's trying to do character development, so I can give it some credit for that, but it doesn't really add anything. Uh, Anya, however, doesn't talk about her family until a little while later when she di decides that she does want to talk about her past because they're, they get a pop tire and Drake has to replace it and it takes a while, so she just tells him about her past. Basically, her parents died when she was really, really young and then she grew up in an orphanage. When she was a teenager, some other boys tried to sexually assault her and she fought them off. And then she got in trouble and the man who ran the orphanage when he was talking to her, he also tried to sexually assault her, and she stabbed him. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know that's not really funny, I shouldn't laugh at that, but like, every man in her life tries to assault her. <laughs> Which makes the earlier scene where Drake saw her naked even dumber than it already was. Like, it's just, I don't know, this whole thing is just so try-hard and edgy, it's like Jordan thinks that rape equals more adult. So because of this, Anya goes to a young offender's prison, the other girls there, thankfully, do not try to rape her, but she does fight them, and she decides not to be a victim, and she beats one of the bully girls up, and that's who she became who she is. Like, and I'll be honest, that that's another thing where we didn't need that much detail. It would probably be more effective if we didn't know that much about it. Like, literally just say, her parents died, the orphanage was really unpleasant, and she decided not to be a victim. You know, a, a few lines of dialogue would suffice here. Sometimes less is more. It, sometimes you need more. You know, if there's a lot of nuance or complexity to the story, then yeah, we need a lot more detail. But there's not a lot of nuance or complexity to Anya's backstory, so we, we, we don't need that much. And I don't mean to harp on this all so much, but this book has so many opportunities to be enjoyable. Even if it's not amazing, it could at least be enjoyable, and it misses all of them because it doesn't know when to stop talking. It just keeps dragging on and on and on. So they reach a house with a large man who Anya speaks to in Arabic, which convenient that she both speaks the language and has a contact in Saudi Arabia willing to help her, but okay. Like, it, it's convenient, but it's not impossible. And so the large man takes her to Hussam, who is an old man that Anya knows. Hussam used to be in the Saudi army, and he's now a smuggler, he agrees to get Anya and Drake into Iraq along with some weapons. Then we cut back to Frost and the others, and Frost finds them via airport footage. Again, a woman driving really should have attracted more attention, they shouldn't have needed that, they should have just asked around and said, hey, were there any reports of a woman driving earlier? Or they just hear about reports of a blonde white lady driving around in downtown Riyadh. Like, that, that can't be that common especially back when it was illegal. Of course, Frost is only able to look over the footage after having a pointless argument with Rahul where he says, a foreign woman can't do that. And she's like, come on, man. And then he relents. Like, all obstacles in this story are introduced and overcome at the same time. I swear to God. Like, it, it's impossible to feel excitement with no buildup. <laughs> Which is so strange because this book is so long and it has almost no buildup. How is that even possible? But Frost and Dietrich do manage to track Drake and Anya to Hussam's home. And then cutting back to them, Hussam gives Drake and Anya some AK-47s. And then we spend, literally, this is probably the best example of how shittily this book is written. We spend an entire page describing what an AK-47 is, as well as the history of the rifle and a physical description of those two specific rifles that Hussam gave to them. And if you don't believe me, it is on page 389 of this book. The whole page is describing what an AK-47 is as if we don't know. Just the whole page. You can go and check that if you don't believe me. Literally, just a paragraph would have been fine, man. Less than a paragraph would have been fine. <laughs> Jesus. So Hussam walks along with Drake for a minute and he asks him to protect Anya because she'll probably die soon. It's... Sure, okay, it's not horrible, but it also doesn't add much. And then Monroe calls and Drake fills him in on everything that's happened. And Monroe claims that Anya actually planned a mutiny and wanted to take the unit rogue, and that's why he tried to kill her. And then he taunts Drake about Operation Hydra and his mysterious discharge. Like, we, we never learn exactly what Operation Hydra is, but it's 
related to why he was kicked out of the army. Uh, and then he hangs up on him. And then we spend some time with Anya, wondering about what it would be like to have children, even though she can't because medical reasons. Be but, you know, she's got to wonder about it because women, am I right, fellas? That's just what broads always think. And then Monroe calls back and he says they need to run. <laughs> God, again, this would be better if it just, if shit just actually happened. So Dietrich arrives in a helicopter, and then Drake and Anya flee through a secret passage in Hussam's house, but Dietrich goes in and finds it immediately. Or, not immediately, I guess Hussam's nephew does try to kill them with a meat cleaver first. Even though Hussam and the rest of the family surrender without a fight, because they're trying to avoid being killed, so you'd think they would just tell the nephew to chill, but whatever, he tries to kill them, they subdue him, no one gets hurt, and then they immediately find the passage where Drake and Anya fled. So Drake and Anya pop up in a garage where there's an escape car waiting for them, but there's a, also a tactical team waiting for them. And Drake aims his gun at one, and rather than shooting him, he just warns him and says, Hey, stay back! Which is... That's not how that works. Like, okay, it, in a real battle, you're supposed to shoot when someone's aiming at you. Like, just holding them up at gunpoint, that's something they do in movies, but it's not a thing in real life, at least not very often. But they don't notice Anya, and she manages to shut off the, the lights, and then she attacks, and then... It, j just listen. Anya was on her in a heartbeat, staring up in horrified fascination. Drake watched her as her hand shot out, gripped the weapon's slide, and shoved it backwards just as Frost pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. With the slide in its rear position, the hammer was blocked preventing it from striking the round in the chamber. Okay, she's not a fucking superhero, guys. Like, she can't do shit like that. She needs to have some moments of vulnerability. And no, being helpless in prison and then a perfect killing machine the whole rest of the book does not count. She needs to rely on others once or twice throughout the story. Because throughout this whole thing, she could have made it this far without Drake. Like, after the initial breakout, she does not need him. And, frankly, he's actually slowing her down. So they win, they subdue the others, and they don't kill anyone, and then they drive off. But while they're fighting, Dieter, or not Dieter, Dietrich asks Drake what's going on, and Drake says, Anya's the only one who can help me right now, and so Dietrich thinks that something else is going on. Apparently, no one realized that Drake's sister has been missing for a couple of days and put the pieces together. Like, they're just wondering, why would Drake betray us? I guess it's just completely out of nowhere, but the thing is, if Drake is on the run, and they know about his family, they would probably have somebody keeping an eye on her, just in case Drake, you know, while on the run, went to her for help. But then somebody would notice, oh hey, she's missing, maybe that is tied into this. Also, they tell the Saudi army and police to go after those two, but once again, they're not being cooperative because we need coincidence to get the heroes out of trouble. Dietrich does, however, take Hussam back to an interrogation room and is interrogating him, trying to figure out where Drake and Anya are going. And he has his wife and his kids tied up in another room, and he shows Hussam a video feed of them. And he threatens to kill them, but Hussam still refuses to say anything. And then he has somebody shoot Hussam's son, and then he relents and tells him where Drake is going. He, he doesn't actually mention the route they're taking across the border, even though earlier they focused on it for a while and gave a lot of detail about it but when he's telling this guy, he doesn't... Okay, whatever. He just says, yeah, they're going to Iraq, and they have a GPS, and so they decide, oh, okay, we can track the GPS. And I know what you might be thinking, but Dietrich didn't actually kill his son. He faked it. Like, he basically had the guy fire a blank at him, and then they tipped his chair over, and then they just froze the video frame on that. So, Hussam thought his son was dead. It's, it's still shitty, but it's a lot less shitty. And to be honest, it feels a little non-committal. You know, it feels like Dietrich would be a more interesting and morally gray character if he killed the kid, but, you know, what, what he did here was still, still a shitty thing to do, you know, pretending to kill someone's kid in front of them. That, that's, that's pretty bad. And from what I heard, that's actually a ripoff of a scene from 24. I've never watched that show, so I can't comment on that, but given how lacking in imagination this whole thing is, Jordan ripping someone off wouldn't shock me. Anyways, Drake and Anya drive for a while, and then they camp out in the desert, and he has a nightmare, and while waking, he actually nearly shoots Anya. And this is when he tells her about his time in Afghanistan. He tells her about a suicide bomber that tried driving a car at him and his men with a young girl there as a human shield, and then he gave the order to kill, and he feels bad about it. And that's a fine enough backstory, but it 
goes on and gets kind of stupid. The horrible irony was that the entire incident had earned him a reputation for making difficult decisions under pressure and brought him to the attention of other, more secretive military units where men with such abilities were in high demand. Eager to escape the constant reminders of what had happened, he had leapt at the chance and barely six months later was back in Afghanistan as part of a covert UK-US task force, 14th Special Operations Group. But any hopes of making a fresh start had been utterly dashed by events later that year. That, however, was a whole other chapter of history, another series of mistakes and missed opportunities in a life filled with them. Either give the backstory or don't. Don't spend all this time teasing it with no intention of following through. You know, stop going, tune in next time for more adventures. If you want a recommendation for a better thriller series, uh, check out the Jack Reacher books. Like, Jack Reacher does have a lot of stuff in his backstory beyond the basics we learn in book one. You know, in book one we learn the basics of his backstory, but it's not brought up in such an obnoxious way, and when we learn more details in later books, it, it's, again, it's not brought up in such an obnoxious way. Like, it doesn't apply to the story at hand, so it's just left alone until later. Thrillers are usually episodic adventures, and redemption is no real exception to that rule. Constant foreshadowing, like, that, that's okay if there's a continuous story throughout the whole series, but... That's not, not the case here, or at least it doesn't seem to be the case here, because having a few characters come back once in a while really doesn't constitute a continuous story. After he tells her all this, Anya tells Drake, oh, it's fine that he's done bad things, they've both killed people, and then they fuck. Really, it's, it's really that abrupt. <laughs> like, sure, Drake, Drake is attracted to her the whole book, book, but this very much is just main character gets the girl because that's what's supposed to happen in thriller, like thrillers. Like, the chemistry between them isn't non-existent. There's, there's some, but there's not a lot. And quite frankly, the sex is really weirdly described. <laughs> he accepted her as she had accepted him, and in the dancing shadows of the fire that came together the only way they knew, pleasure and pain, joy and grief, hope and fear mingled together and rose to an unbearable crescendo as their cries mingled together and were lost amidst the endless desert. What the hell was that? Oh, God. That yeeted me right back to Light Lark, man. <laughs> like, that is so bad. <laughs> like, then after that, there's a whole chapter of Drake going, Oh, I'm sorry, I really shouldn't have done that, I took advantage of you. And Anya going, No, really, it's, it's okay, I wanted it. And we still have a hundred pages left. And because Will Jordan thinks that literally every detail of a character's life needs to be litigated and explained to the audience, he tells her about how he used to be a boxer and bo broke both hands in a fight because he refused to give up, which... Uh, sure, okay, whatever. Finally, they go to a cave and they meet Typhoon. He's a young man, his real name is Majid Zabari. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And meanwhile, Dietrich and Frost track their GPS and find out where they are. Now, Zabari uh, was a low-level worker in Iraqi intelligence, and he explains that Saddam Hussein was buying biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons from Russia. Uh, the seller was a man named Yevgeny. And again, right-wing thrillers are just, like, weirdly obsessed with saying, No, no, Iraq really did have nukes, we promise! Now, in this book, at least, uh, it's specifically mentioned that Saddam Hussein did dismantle the program before the U.S. invasion happened, so it's a, a lot less dumb than Ben Shapiro's take on it, but... You know, still, still dumb. And anyway, Zabari says that all he knows is Yevgeny worked through a company called Infinity Exports. And then Anya freaks out because, twist, apparently Infinity Exports is a shell corporation run by the CIA. The CIA set all this up. The CIA sold them weapons to justify the American invasion. Specifically, Kane, Marcus Kane, sold them weapons because he was in charge of this plan. Except, like, th th there weren't... WMDs like that that wasn't a thing like they sold them weapons to justify the invasion but then there were no weapons after the invasion and the book acknowledges that like it the book specifically says that they were trying to justify an illegal war so the whole plan was really pointless it's also kind of annoying that we learn everything that was going on all at once like there's no time with the characters finding clues and piecing it all together so the reveal is a lot less satisfying but Okay. Anyways, they plan to take Zabari across the border into Saudi Arabia and just give some evidence he has to the media. And as Dietrich is about to go after the two of them, Kane takes over his mission 
and he sends in his own team and cuts off video so Dietrich can't see what happens. When they leave the cave, Drake actually tries to hold Anya at gunpoint to take Zabari to Monroe because he wants to save his sister. Like, he doesn't want to take him to the media, he wants to save his sister. And this might be an interesting scene, you know, we're showing Drake being forced to choose between his friend and his sister, and we're seeing Anya choosing between doing the right thing and helping Drake. But this is like the one scene in the book that isn't long enough to have much of an impact. It's, this is one of the few parts where I would say it's too short, they should spend a little more time on it, because they're interrupted when a missile comes in and explodes near them, preventing any sort of conflict or character development. And they're wounded during the explosion, Anya gets hit with a few pieces of shrapnel, but she's mostly fine, that becomes relevant in a minute, and then some soldiers arrive and take them prisoner. Then we cut back to Franklin. Remember him? It's been a while, but <laughs> we cut back to Franklin, who knows that something suspicious is happening. So he decides to save Drake, because Drake actually saved his life back when they were in Afghanistan. He tells a subordinate to spy on Kane's communications, and the subordinate is able to do it because there's just a back door that he can use. Yeah, like a, a high-ranking member of the CIA has terrible cybersecurity in his office. Sure. I'm really glad that the good guys just have everything lined up for them. You know, terrible cybersecurity, good wind for floating into a prison, a guy who looks a, a lot like Drake whose passport they can steal. I'm really glad they don't have to work for their victory. So after spying on Kane for a minute, they realize what's going on, and Franklin tells Dietrich to go after Drake and save him. But Dietrich was already doing that. Like, he was already disobeying orders, and he was on his way to help. So we got stuff with two different characters separately angsting about whether or not they should save their friend. We really only needed one. Personally, I would suggest using Dietrich. You know, ha have him angst about it, and because we've spent more time with him throughout the book, it would be a much better, more triumphant moment. You know, he'd decide, I don't like Drake very much, but he deserves better than this, and I do owe him a lot. You know, people who dislike each other learn to work together all the time. It, it would be a much bigger moment, especially if he called in to Franklin and he told him what was going on, and then Franklin was just on board with it. So Drake, Anya, and Zabari are dragged off to an abandoned airfield, and then Monroe appears. And he, there's no easy way to put this, but he's described in a vaguely homoerotic fashion. But it was more than that. There was a presence about him, a charisma, a dominating air of command, and that went far beyond physical size. Monroe had been a leader of men, born to take them into battle, and despite everything, he remembered that. That is exactly how love interests are described in erotica. <laughs> So between that and the earlier sex scene, I'm wondering what Will Jordan might have published under other names. <laughs> Drake's sister gets dragged in, he sees that she's alright, you know, shaken up, but unharmed, and then she gets dragged out immediately, and Monroe implies that he'll kill all of them, and then he thinks about Anya for a bit. It turns out he was kind of in love with her, and was mad that she didn't like him back. He was also mad that she took credit for all his work, mostly. He was mad for her taking credit for all his work. And then Kane actually lied to him and told her, told him that she was going to go rogue, and so that's why he tried to kill her. Like, again, Kane set this all up. Kane was behind the whole operation. He sold Iraq WMDs to justify an invasion, but then they dismantled them so there was no justification, but then they invaded anyways. Now they're just trying to cover up the weapons sales. So Kane got Monroe out of prison, and then he set up the rescue of Anya, then Monroe taking Jessica like that whole thing, and then them finding Zabari. And this is a really stupid plan. Literally all he would have to do is rescue Anya, find out who her contact is, and then eliminate him. Like, Kane would just have to keep all the players separate, and only he would know the plan. Because this weird, convoluted, Rube Goldberg machine of stupidity, it could have gone south a hundred different ways before this point. You know, Drake could have been killed at basically any point throughout all this. He could have, when he first got the phone call, told Monroe, told others about Monroe kidnapping his sister instead of just going along with it. DC traffic could have prevented their escape. The Saudis could have done their job and stopped him. Drake could have been unable to find a way out of the country. And maybe some of this could be excused by Kane working behind the scenes, but that would just lead to people being suspicious or investigating him for doing it. Also, uh, all the men who are with Monroe, those are private military contractors, mercenaries, and Kane hired them to help Monroe. Meaning there's a paper trail. Someone would figure out what he did at some point. Like, Kane could have done this with zero suspicion, and instead he, instead he killed a bunch of people and just created a huge shitstorm. 
Some people are really fucking stupid. And the thing is, Zabari doesn't seem to have that much evidence of what went on. Like, he was a low-level intelligence worker. His testimony and whatever else he might have would be bad, but it's a lot easier to smear him as a liar or have him eliminated if he went public, because it's literally just one dude. Even Anya didn't actually know who he was until very recently. And after all this, Kane's plan still goes badly, and ultimately it does fail. Like, maybe this whole thing could have been something if the book implied, or if the characters just said, that there were a lot better ways for Kane to handle things, but he's just so paranoid and caught up in the world of espionage that he makes dumb mistakes. Like, it's not mentioned though, so I have to assume that it was an accident on the author's part and not something he did deliberately. So Monroe just kills Zabari, like, right away. He, he gets rid of him, and then he beats up Anya for a bit, and normally I'd say like, oh, just finish her off already, you idiot, but he's getting revenge. Him dragging it out actually makes sense. You know, he, he wants to save her this. That, that does make sense for him and his character. But while Anya is being beaten, she actually pulls some shrapnel out of her back and picks the lock on her handcuffs with it. <laughs> and that's awesome. <laughs> it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, because if it's big enough for her to pull out by hand, and she later stabs someone with it, then it would be too big to pick a lock. So it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is still awesome. The bad news is that we spend three and a half pages with her trying to distract Monroe and thinking about how she nearly became a high-ranking CIA commander before she finally gets her cuffs off and then stabs him with the shrapnel. Like, one page really does feel like the sweet spot for this scene, you know? It's long enough to build up, but short enough to not feel boring. So anyways, a helicopter comes nearby and it's Dietrich and his team and Anya frees herself and then stabs Monroe with the shrapnel and then she takes his gun and kills two men and she actually shoots him as well but he runs off, he's... I don't think we actually find out where he gets shot but it's... he, he doesn't die. And then Drake asks her to free him so that he can help but then she just runs off and leaves him. Like, <laughs> what a bitch. Drake is, however, able to grab some keys from a dead guard, and then he goes off to rescue Jessica. And he saves her without any trouble, and then Dietrich arrives, and then Drake explains things to him. I believe you. He said it last. But I should fucking shoot you for all the trouble you've caused. Drake couldn't help but smile just a little. You can shoot me later. First, we have to find Monroe. He's the only one left who can bring Kane down. That line is just... It's trying too hard. Okay, it's trying too hard to be dramatic. So, Kane orders a predator drone sh to strike and kill everyone there and, you know, erase all evidence of his crime, which... J just a lot of action stuff happening for the climax, which sounds great on paper, but as we've established, action is described the way a child describes taking a math test. Like, I should be into all of this, but I just can't care. It's not that I don't care, it's that I can't. So Anya catches Monroe, holds him up at gunpoint, but then she throws her weapon away to fight hand to hand. <laughs> Oh my god, that is literally, literally the thing that the villain did at the end of Commando. I don't need no gun! I gotta kill you now! Hey, remember how she got hit with a missile and has shrapnel wounds? And how he just got shot? I guess this realistic spy thriller is set in a world where people just shrug off all wounds. Alright. Anyways, meanwhile, Dietrich and Frost try to stop the drone, and then Monroe and Anya fight hand-to-hand -hand for a little while. It drags on, as you may imagine, and Monroe does beat Anya because she's very wounded, but, like, he's also wounded too. And then he gloats as he's about to stab her, so she breaks his leg, but then he falls down and he grabs his discarded gun, and he's about to shoot her, but then Drake arrives and shoots him. But then... Monroe survives, and he runs off and steals a car and escapes. But then, the drone shoots it with a missile and kills him. Yeah, because it turns out Frost was able to take the drone over. Like, the computer setup that Monroe was using to take control of Predator drones, it was just sitting around. <laughs> like, and so she was able to use it. I guess Monroe was just logged into the program despite not planning on using the drones for anything anytime soon. But wait! There's more! because somehow Monroe survived the explosion from a Hellfire missile after already being shot multiple times, and then Anya and Drake catch up to him and try to take him prisoner, but he aims a gun at them, and then they shoot him, and he dies. But he still doesn't die right away. His fading eyes met hers, and just for a moment, a look of understanding passed between them. With a final effort, he reached up and clasped her hand. Don't end up like me. 
Anya. Okay, more dramatic does not automatically equal better, guys. Like, his last words honestly make his character a little confusing. Do does he hate her? Does he hate himself? I think he has a lot of confusing feelings here, but it's, it's just hard to say. So then Anya and Drake talk for a minute and realize, like, again, Kane was behind this whole thing. And she says she's not going to go back into custody. She's going to stay free and take down Kane on her own. Drake actually tries to follow her so he can help, but she shoots him in the stomach in order to prevent it. Could have just knocked him out, you twat, but okay, whatever. And she tells him to claim that he tried to bring her in, but she betrayed him and shot him. But the thing is, she really did shoot him. Like, she did betray him. That's not a lie here. But she avoided anything vital and also didn't puncture his bowels. Isn't that convenient? Like, she shot him, but it, it won't affect him at all going forward. Again, people shrug off being shot and blown up very easily in this book. But now we have finally caught up to the prologue where Drake is dying in the desert. Do you remember that? Because by the time I reached this part of the book, I had forgotten it happened. And it really just hammers home how unnecessary it is. And again, Dietrich arrives in a helicopter and rescues him. Back in Langley, Franklin storms into Kane's office and tries to tell him that he'll tell everyone what he did. But with Zabari dead, he has no real proof. And all the record shows is his own insubordination because he ordered Dietrich's team to rescue Drake. So Kane could have him fired and or arrested for that. But the thing is, if he does that, Franklin is going to say something about Kane's, you know, shenanigans. And if he says anything, even if he doesn't have proof, there will be an investigation and it might bring up something else that could wreck Kane's career. So they have mutually assured destruction here. They could both wreck each other's careers. So they make a deal. Kane is due to be promoted to deputy CIA director soon, and he will recommend that Franklin take his place as the head of the special activities division. Plus, he's not going to try killing Drake or any of the others. He has a short monologue about how he once thought he could do some good and change the world from this position, and if Franklin really thinks it's so easy to keep his hands clean at this job, he should give it a shot, and Franklin agrees. And, like, this bit is almost interesting. Like, maybe it goes somewhere in the sequels, so I'll, I'll give it that. And then we get about 10 pages of Drake and others trying to convince Franklin to bring down Kane, but he says no. Once more, we go over that whole conversation the two of them just had. We, we go over all the information we just learned again. Uh, Kane thinks about how awesome Anya is and how she's coming for him and he's evil and regrets everything. And then Jessica comes to visit Drake. Apparently, there was a whole cover story about her kidnapping. Uh, but... She also told her husband what actually happened, and he's mad at Drake now, which, again, that's stupid. That's a good way to get arrested. And then Drake thinks about some sequel bait. He thinks about his discharge, Operation Hydra, the, remember the thing he got discharged for, what Anya's going to try doing with Kane, etc. And his sister asks what he'll do with his second chance, and he just says, my job. And then the book ends. Honestly, a pretty dull ending considering the subject matter of this book. All right, I really don't have a good place to put this in the main body of this video, but it needs to be discussed. Will Jordan has made a movie based on his own books. <laughs> uh, the trailer is out. I don't believe the movie is out yet by the time this video releases, but the trailer also doesn't give a release date, so I don't actually know. It's called Rogue Elements, a Ryan Drake story. I, I think it's meant... It's not a direct adaptation of any of the books. It's just meant to be an original story in this world with the same characters because there are no books in the series called Rogue Elements. And I will say real quick, Rogue Elements is a much better title than Redemption. You know, it, it tells you that it's about spy stuff. It's not a generic one-word title. But I, I don't know. Maybe I've just read too many shitty YA novels because those do that a lot. Like, the, just the generic one-word title. It's, it's annoying. Anyways, the trailer for Rogue Elements, a Ryan Drake story, is bad. I guess we're in for a long night. Because I don't know shit. We have just under two hours to figure out how to get inside that warehouse, find Fedorov, and get the fuck out in one piece. Like, the whole movie is just so yellow. Why do you love yellow so much, Will? I don't get it. Like, I know the trailers can be deceiving, but this movie honestly just looks like shit. The acting is wooden, the dialogue is bad, 
I mean, the trailer ends on this line. The only people dying today are those fuckers. All of them. It's meant to sound cool, but it's just a weird way of talking. The action, at least from what we see here, is full of quick cuts, so we don't really get to see any of the fight choreography. Like, it just, it just seems low budget and incompetent. And that knife they had, it just looks so fake. It seriously is like somebody went to a prop store and said, give me your fakest, most rubbery looking knife. And Ryan Drake's haircut is really stupid. Like, that, that's not really commenting on the quality of the filmmaking or anything, but it is very stupid looking. Just, I don't know, the whole thing feels like if Uva Bowl made a Call of Duty movie in 2010, or like a straight-to-DVD Steven Seagal film. Like, e even Critical Drinker's own comment section hates it, but the few positive comments have hearts, which means he read through all that. <laughs> like, I wonder if his film reviewing buddies on YouTube are going to tell him it sucks. They probably won't, but I, I can wonder. <laughs> like, I don't know, part of me wants to commend him for putting in the effort, but that doesn't make the movie better. You know, Tommy Wiseau put a lot of effort into the room. That's still a hilarious train wreck. And I would say that, oh, maybe now that Will Jordan knows how difficult it is to make a movie, he'll have more nuance in his future criticisms, and he won't, you know, personally attack filmmakers and actors who do things he doesn't like, but it's it's not going to temper his future criticisms. Remember, all, all of his criticisms are just culture war bullshit. Anyways, that's the end of the movie interlude. It doesn't tie into my thoughts on redemption, really, but I just needed to say something. So redemption is not very good. Like, its plot is a mess. Its action isn't very exciting. Its characters are flat. And most of all, it's just fucking boring. I really don't like describing entire books, especially ones this long, using one word, but boring is the one word I would use to describe this. Like, most of the scenes are three times as long as they need to be. There are entire chapters that could have been cut without us missing anything. The descriptions of things just drag on forever, and information keeps getting repeated for no real reason. I would honestly say, that this is worse than True Allegiance, Ben Shapiro's book. Because while True Allegiance was worse written in some ways, like, you know, the characters were weirder, the dialogue was stupider, the plot was a lot more scattered, it wasn't boring. You know, it, it didn't outstay its welcome either. It's a relatively short book, and it had a lot of crazy stuff that I could laugh at. Remember the scene in that book where there was a terrorist on a plane and no one stopped him because of political correctness? That is a thing that happens in that book, by the way. I'm not making that up. Like, that book is not boring. True Allegiance is not boring. Being boring is the second worst sin that a book can commit. The worst sin is being boring for a very long period of time. Redemption is pretty long, and aside from a few moments, is very boring. Again, there are a few moments in here that kind of work. You know, there are parts of the prison breakout which were kind of cool, and did work, and got me invested. The moment with Anya pulling shrapnel, shrapnel out of herself and picking a lock with it was kinda cool, but that is the only level it reaches. That's the only level it aspires to. Just kind of cool. It reminds me a lot of a book I reviewed last year called Leviathan by R.M. Huffman, and you can check out my video on it if you want a lot more information. But basically, it's a book that sounds awesome on paper, but it's just really boring because the author doesn't know how to make the audience care about what's happening. You know, like, this is a book that involves, like, fallen angels and dragons and dinosaurs and Nephilim and stuff. It, it sounds awesome, but it's not. It, it's just not. Like, the author is unable to understand that other people have their own feelings and thoughts. So he thinks that because he loves all these characters, everyone else automatically will too. Like... I, I swear, he hasn't developed theory of mind yet, and Redemption is also a lot like that. Like, why should I care about Drake? Like, sure, some of these events sound cool, but why should I care about Drake? He's trying to save his sister, but he also killed a child in the backstory and possibly did other nasty stuff. Like, that gray morality isn't really focused on, and there's not much to him besides that. Maybe he's an alcoholic, but he doesn't it doesn't affect anything, and the book honestly seems to forget about it most of the time. So, what is there to say about Ryan Drake? I, not a lot. Like, most thrillers are competency porn. 
You know, incompetency porn is just like watching characters be really, really good at doing something. Like, in thrillers, usually we get to watch the protagonist be a smart, cool, tough badass who fights bad guys. But that's not the case here. Drake is in Anya's shadow for most of the book. And that is hilarious to me, because if Jordan saw that anywhere else, he would pitch an absolute fit over it. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can beat you right now as a girl, but eventually you're going to be a man. And I, it doesn't matter how hard I train, you're going to be bigger and faster right. and stronger than I can ever be. And you're just going to be better and you're going to beat me. And I can't stop that. But it's true. You know, the, the show is like honest about that. Like, if somebody else wrote Anya, he'd go on about how she's a Mary Sue and was forced in for diversity points. And then he'd claim, well, the book obviously failed, regardless of how well it sold, because audiences are tired of wokeness. And then he'd say people are tired of Western authors and are now reading Japanese books like... Um, well, I'm sure he could think of at least one Japanese book. He's such a fucking expert. I feel like if Drinker's fans knew about Anya, most of them would be very upset with him. They don't know about Anya because many of them can't read, but, you know, if they did, they'd be upset. And even setting aside the whole two-faced nature of his approach to this subject, Anya's just not that well written. You know, it's like, she's all right, but the weird focus on sexual assault was clumsy, and she was just kind of too perfect outside of that. Like, she punches her way out of most problems. Men are generally bigger, strong. She rarely has to think about how to deal with things or how to approach situations. And it never really dives into the, oh, I'm a monster, I'm a killing machine angst that she has briefly at a few points. Like, specifically, the first time we see it is after she kills Bastard. She's like, oh my god, what have I done? It's, I, I don't know, it's, it's weird. And I don't have a good place to put this either, but the characters in this book repeatedly refer to Anya as a paramilitary leader. That's not what she is. She's a field agent for an intelligence service. A paramilitary, or militia, like the, the line between those two things can get kind of blurry, but a paramilitary is an unofficial military force. Like, being an agent for an intelligence service is not the same as being in a paramilitary. Like, Anya could easily be somebody who trains or advises or leads paramilitaries in foreign countries to advance American interests, but that's not something that's brought up in the book. Like, they seem to be referring to shepherd teams as paramilitary units, and Unless paramilitary means something else in Scotland, Will Jordan is using that word wrong. Now, back to complaining about the characters. Uh, Dietrich is an asshole, and then we learn he's a heroin addict, and suddenly he's great. You know, there's no evil stuff after that, there's no screw-ups after that. He's just, he's a heroin addict, but now he's, he's a good guy. And Kane could have actually been a very compelling villain. I think he brushes up against being a compelling villain. If they had spent time on the idea that he used to be a decent guy, but the harsh reality of espionage made him evil, I think I would have been really into him. Or if he was so smart, if he was smart, but he's just so paranoid that he makes dumb mistakes, then that also could have been really interesting. You know, he, he gets hoisted by his own petard, as it were. But that doesn't happen, so he's just an idiot, and we're supposed to think of him as being smart and dangerous, you know? And everyone else, besides the people I mentioned, is really just a warm body that fulfills some role in the story. And the plot... Oh God, the plot. The plot is just, this person did this, this person did that, with very little build-up, a lot of repetition, and nothing in the way of themes to, like, tie it together and keep the audience invested at all. It, like, this whole book can literally just be described as, they break Anya out of prison, Drake and Anya escape from the CIA, and then the climax happens. The space between the big moments should be filled with stuff like character development and, you know, build up to big moments and exposition, which, you know, builds the world and builds the setting and builds all these characters and everything, but instead it's filled with... I, I, I don't even know what to call it. Like, filler? Like, that, that seems generous because at least filler isn't the same thing over and over and over and over again. Like, I just, I, I don't know, man. Like, the most I've heard anyone talk about Jordan's books, even when they're criticizing him and his channel, is to call them formulaic thrillers, but I think that's being too generous. I think Redemption aspires to be formulaic. Like, it can't even imagine anything beyond being formulaic. So, like, that, that's the limit of the author's imagination. But he doesn't know how to do this type of story, or he's just too lazy to do it properly. He doesn't make us like or care about the characters. He doesn't make the villain plan something the heroes work to uncover. He doesn't have them think their way out of trouble. We don't get much time watching Drake be competent at all. And unless 
Anya is supposed to be the real protagonist, but if she's the real protagonist, then it's dumb for the series to be called Ryan Drake. There are several Chekhov's guns in this story that remain unfired, like the alcoholism, the heroin addiction, all the stuff about Operation Hydra, and instead it's relegated to being clumsy sequel bait. Now there's a subtle difference between good and bad sequel bait. If the story or the characters don't make sense without knowing what happens in the sequels, then it's bad bait. And honestly, the best part of all this is just how much it flies in the face of Will Jordan's own espoused views. Like, when a woman does anything in a big Hollywood movie, there's money in repeating his audience's views back at them. But when he has his protagonist get shown up by a woman in his book, it's fine. Like, he doesn't believe anything that he claims to believe. Like, we established earlier that he is a liar. Okay, this is all just a grift for him. And as we established again, he makes a lot of money from this. I don't know, there's uh, There's just not much else to say. Like, the book didn't try to make me care. And that's the thing that makes me lose any sort of respect for it, even though, again, it kinda works at a few points, I just don't respect it because it didn't try. Like, if it was bad but it tried to be good, I would respect it, but this feels like it didn't try. And the thing is, this book came out in 2012. That is before The Critical Drinker started on YouTube. One of the oldest videos on his channel is actually a trailer for the book, and it was several years after that that he started doing regular movie reviews. So, Will Jordan is not a shitty YouTuber who wrote a mediocre book, he's a mediocre author who made a shitty YouTube channel. Which is the exact opposite of most bad YouTube books. But, in both cases, the person in question isn't known for writing books, they're known for YouTube. Will Jordan is not going to be known for his books, no matter how many of them he puts out, and no matter how much they sell. He's not going to be known as an author. He's going to be known as a 40-year-old man who throws fits about the Barbie movie. He's going to be known as a guy who lies about Star Trek ruining society for money. And nothing I say could ever roast him more than that simple fact. So that is Redemption. I know there's a lot of sequels. I don't think I'll ever do anything with them. I, I really doubt they have anything new to laugh at. I mean, it, if they do get crazier or stupider, then maybe I'll do something with them, but... I don't think I will. My next big project is going to be a very brief summary of the Vampire Academy books because those, from everything I've heard, are a hilarious mess, but it's also a long series, so it'll probably take me a while to do that. And then after that will be my next ultra-long review, and I'm not totally sure what that'll be on. Like, it'll probably be Blue Bloods because I've had those sitting around forever, but if you guys have other suggestions, feel free to Hit me with them down below. Like, just, just make sure it's something funny bad, or at least interesting bad, instead of boring bad. Because I can only take so much more of crap like this. And thanks to all the people who allowed me to use clips from their videos to illustrate my points. Check out their stuff if you want to see more of that. And uh, that's about all for today. Goodbye. Hello to everyone who watched this far. Not sure why you did that, but you know, thanks. Appreciate it. You're cool. Uh, all these names you see here, those are my patrons. Special thanks to my $10 and up patrons who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodis, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Ich bin Langweilig, Jalal Delul, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Proscriptions of Juo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Vevictus, Wesley, and Zenitech89. You're cool. I like you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this. If you want access to exclusive content, as well as early access to my videos, and you want your name here, then consider donating over on Patreon. Or becoming a YouTube channel member. You know, that works too. I don't have anything else to say here. I don't know why you're still watching. Goodbye.